Arcade Exclusives. Hello and welcome to another episode of Arcade Exclusives where we take a look at some of the games that never left the arcades. Today we're looking at Sega and as Sega have such a long list of arcade only titles, we're specifically looking at their arcade racers. Today I'm joined by the brilliant Nick from Blast Processing, a channel which I absolutely love. Link in the description so if you're a Sega fan do yourself a favour and check him out. Thanks for having me Pete. You know me. I'm always up for a chat about Sega games. And a bit of a disclaimer here. I know I pronounce it Sega, not Sega. Look, I've heard it all before, but everyone I knew here in Australia growing up called it Sega. Right or wrong, it's muscle memory. So apologies in advance, and now let's get on with the good stuff. Sega is very well known for its arcade racing games, and they've produced so many classics over the years. Outrun, Hang On, Sega Rally, Daytona, Power Drift, the list is very long. But they made a good number of racing games that never left the arcades, never to grace a home console. Let's have a look at 12 of them. First we'll look at F1 Exhaust Note, released for Sega's System32 arcade hardware in 1991 an arcade Formula 1 racer, but without any official license. As a result, the tracks and cars were created by Sega, although the latter resemble some of the early 90s F1 cars. You can select either automatic or manual transmission. Automatic gives you a 720 horsepower V10 engine, while manual gives you a bit more oomph with a 780 horsepower V12. So the increased difficulty of manual gear changes comes with the advantage of having a bit more power. The gameplay is very arcadey and quite simple, race for the best position possible over several laps, while also ensuring you don't run out of time, so like a position based checkpoint system. Graphically it's a stunner, with huge chunky vehicles and that gorgeous 90s Sega arcade racer aesthetic. The music is lacking variety with only two tracks, but the sound effects are top draw for 1991, with screeching tyres and engine sounds that sound like the real thing. The twin cabinet itself was quite impressive. Not only was it one of Sega's first sit down arcade racing games, it also featured pedals and paddles for changing gear, which was uncommon at the time, and was also the first arcade cab to feature a dual screen attract sequence, which displayed across both screens when not in use. F1 Exhaust Note was overshadowed by many of the Sega arcade racers that followed, and the fact that it never left the arcade certainly didn't help its exposure but it's a superb entry in Sega's library of arcade racing games and a fitting start to this list. AB Cop was a late 1990 release that certainly reflects many of the trends in arcades at the time. In this game, you play as a futuristic policeman who is tasked with running down criminals using your airbike, hence the name of the game. It's clear that this is a Sega published title, with bright colours and superscalar graphics that deliver a visual punch right from the get-go. However, this game was actually developed by a different Japanese studio called Icom, whose other titles include Viewpoint, Polestar and Saint Dragon. First impressions may lead you to believe that the game is mostly similar to other Sega arcade classics, like Space Harrier or Galaxy Force 2, but the gameplay is actually a bit different. Rather than feeling like a road-bound space shooter, this game plays like an even more action-packed version of Chase HQ. Each stage in the game tasks you with bringing down a gang leader. However, before you're given the chance to do this, you need to take out all the other gang members first. This is where the action comes in, as you need to swerve and crash into all of these gang members along the way so that you can face the boss before the timer runs out. It's like an inverted take on Chase HQ. In that game, you spend more time avoiding obstacles on the road whilst trying to catch up to the boss, whereas in AB Cop, you're basically forced to do the exact opposite. AB Cop isn't quite in the same echelon as the top tier superscalar games, but it is certainly no slouch either. 
It looks the part and provides some exciting, explosive gameplay to back it up. Fast forward to 1998 and the release of Daytona USA 2, Battle on the Edge. This was released for Sega's Model 3 arcade hardware and was primarily available as a deluxe cab with a large screen and reclined racing seat, although twin cabs were also available which could be linked to allow 16 player races. You're offered three courses of varying lengths and difficulties, a short 8 lap beginner course, a medium 4 lap advance course and an expert course with two very long laps. There's also a choice of three cars, easy, normal and hard, which add another level of refinement for the difficulty. The graphics in Daytona 2 are absolutely stunning even today, demonstrating the capabilities of the Model 3 hardware. The tracks, scenery and heads up display are the highlights here, with huge amounts of detail that never waver even when driving at breakneck speed, and the sense of speed is significant. The late 90s arcade races of this ilk have aged very well and Daytona 2 is no exception. Basically, it's Daytona, but better. The soundtrack was similar to its predecessors, although it's perhaps a bit more mature, but retains that lovable cheesiness that Daytona's music was known for. Later the same year came an updated version of Daytona 2 called the Power Edition, which implemented several changes and improvements. A Dreamcast version was planned, but was ultimately scrapped in favour of Daytona USA 2001, which, although being an updated version of the original Daytona, implemented some of the features from Daytona 2. A shame, as I would have preferred to have seen this come to the Dreamcast. This quirky arcade-only title just screams Sega from the get-go. Released in 1999, Emergency Call Ambulance puts the player in the shoes of an ambulance driver in Chicago, then challenges you with a variety of scenarios that get harder and harder as you go along. Your first challenge is rescuing a 10-year-old boy after his family's car was in a collision, but by the end of the game, you are quite literally rescuing a president from a fallen airliner. The context for each challenge escalates in an absurd way, but the gameplay remains the same. Get your patient to the hospital before their health runs out. On the surface, the game looks a lot like Crazy Taxi as you drive quickly through a city environment, getting from point A to point B in a limited amount of time. However, Crazy Taxi was a lot more open and acted more like a playground, whereas emergency call ambulances scenarios are more focused and function more like tracks. Despite the silly overtones of the game, it does a good job putting pressure on you to make it to your goal. The constant beeping of the medical equipment, the picture-in-picture -picture view of the patient's status in the back of your ambulance, and the directions back to the hospital constantly being delivered to you Sega Rally style, all combine to create an experience that is more tense and exhilarating than first impressions would imply. The game is gorgeous, which isn't a surprise considering it runs on Sega's Model 3 hardware. The sit-down cabinet also made the experience extremely immersive. Perhaps the reason it never made it home is that the experience itself is quite short and linear. It wouldn't be the same on a standard controller without the cabinet. It's perfect for the arcade, but it might have had a tough time as a console release. Then again, the same could be said for Crazy Taxi, so who knows? There had been a rumour in the official Dreamcast magazine that Sega was preparing a collection containing Emergency Call Ambulance, along with Brave Firefighters and Jambo Safari, which all sounds much more sensible. But sadly, this never came to be. Oh well. Most arcade races don't strive for realism, but Cool Riders is something else. This is wacky to say the least. Released in 1995 for Sega's H1 board, Cool Riders was in fact its only arcade game. It was also used in a Sega coin pushing machine called Aqua Stage, but this merely had arcade screens and wasn't an arcade video game. Cool Riders was available as a twin cab with two handlebar controllers. Unlike the other races on this list, Cool Riders used digitised sprites. 
perhaps an odd choice for a racing game, but it actually works, as it somehow fits with the game's comical nature. The gameplay involves racing various bikes through five stages. The selection of bikes are all very different, for example a motorbike with a sidecar, a huge three-wheeled trike, and even a push bike. Their respective characters are equally as eccentric. The courses are quite varied too, with some quite nicely drawn backdrops. As I said, there are only five, but each has multiple routes. The aim of each race is to beat a rival to the finish line, who shouts things at you as they pass, with insults being not only spoken, but displayed in these little speech bubbles. You're also racing against time, so you have to hit the checkpoints within the allocated time limits. It's quirky and quite funny, but it's not the most accomplished racer, and in 1995 there were a plethora of better arcade races available, so it's no big mystery why Cool Riders remained an arcade exclusive. Wave Runner is a fun attempt by Sega in 1996 to take their signature arcade racing style and move it from the road to the water. It mostly works well, as the bright blues and teals of the ocean perfectly suit the colour palette and overall aesthetic that their races commonly shot for. There were a few shortcomings that prevented it from becoming a stone cold classic like other Sega arcade races were. On the surface, this game can basically be described as Daytona on jet skis. You are one of 10 races on each track, and you make your way from checkpoint to checkpoint as you attempt to make it to the end before the timer runs out. It's a Model 2 game, so it features similar characteristics to other Sega races on the hardware. Bright colors, 60 frames per second gameplay, you know the drill. The gameplay itself was tuned to feel unique as well. Turning on water felt drastically different to cornering on a road, with more foresight needed and a greater emphasis on balance and weight when driving into and out of corners. Tracks also featured a variety of jumps and were often quite wide, allowing more space to move than the relatively tight tracks of its asphalt brethren. You also get a sense of skipping along the waves as the undulating surface of the water causes your race to constantly be bouncing up and down as they race. The biggest draw was likely the cabinet itself. Wave Runner was presented on a huge screen with a replica water ski in front of it for the player to ride on. This drastically added to the sensation of actually being on the water, as the leaning and sliding done by the player in real life is reflected on the screen. The flip side of this is that Wave Runner seems quite reliant on the impact of the cabinet. The game's flaws become more obvious once the novelty of the custom cabinet is stripped away. The graphics are nice, but environments are not quite as varied as other Sega races. The music is passable, but forgettable. The announcer is, well, a little odd, and doesn't sound as genuinely excited as those in Sega's other games. With all that in mind, it's probably not too surprising that this ended up as an arcade-only game. Compared to something like Wave Race 64, it just doesn't have the substance to hold up over time, particularly when you take away the fancy cabinet. Still, it's a fun game in short bursts, and definitely worth a go if you can find the arcade version somewhere. And now for something a bit different, Rough Racer, released solely in Japan for Sega's System 24 hardware in 1990. This is quite the departure from Sega's usual arcade racers, instead playing more like Super Off-Road. Played from a similar top-down viewpoint, Rough Racer sees you race against three rival cars around a small circuit. In addition to the four cars racing around the track, there are various construction vehicles present like steamrollers or trucks, which either act as a hindrance or place hazards on the track. It's all just a little bit bland, the tracks are very short and lack interesting features like jumps or any sort of elevation. The one addition that's quite welcome is the barriers, some of which retract at regular intervals, allowing you to take advantage of a shortcut if timed right, and other barriers which must be smashed through. The presentation isn't the only aspect reminiscent of Super Off-Road, the aim is to place in the top three, and you can collect cash along the way, some collected on tracks, and some awarded for placing in the race. Cash on tracks can be collected by boosting into the construction vehicles or by smashing through the aforementioned barriers, where in both instances a shower of coins will fall onto the road. 
This cash can then be spent between races on upgraded tyres, shields, which is an odd term for a car, and nitros. So again, just like super off-road, but with half the options. One difference with the nitros is you can use them to boost into your opponents, causing them to crash. My main niggle is that the tracks are so short that the races are often over within as little as 30 seconds, so you feel like you're spending more time in the menu screens than actually racing. I'd avoid Rough Racer and go with the far superior racer from the previous year, Super Off-Road. Did I mention Super Off-Road? I'm going to avoid dancing around this one. The fact that there was never a port of Scud Race is one of the biggest injustices in Sega's history. Now, Sega have made many, many mistakes over the years, and a lot of them were more significant than this. However, the stars were aligned for a brilliant port that really could have added to the Dreamcast's early library. Scud Race came out in the arcades in 1996 and is very similar to Daytona USA in both gameplay and aesthetics. It's bright, loud, fast, and an absolute blast to play. With a grid full of cars to race against, the gameplay is furious and the tracks are perfectly tuned to amplify that intensity. Powered by the Model 3 arcade board, Scud Race sees you running through a huge range of environments that show off some of the best visuals of the era, all at 60 frames per second. Lighting and color is matched up against detailed architecture and excellent textures, bringing life to each track and giving a similar first impression to when you first played Daytona USA in the arcade. For many people, this was likely their first taste of Model 3 hardware, and you really couldn't ask for more. The tracks are varied. Some are more realistic, snaking through canyons and brightly lit industrial areas. Others are more creative, such as the super beginner track in the Scud Race Plus update that saw your cars shrunk down to race through a house micro-machine style bowling minigame and other obstacles included. Perhaps the most memorable track is Dolphin Tunnel, where you dip in and out of an underground road, flanked by glass walls, water, and undersea wildlife. Diving in and out of these beautiful, but claustrophobic tunnels at extremely high speeds is a fantastic introduction to the game, and absolutely oozes with that trademark Sega style. Scud Race was actually announced as a launch window title for the Dreamcast, but despite the existence of a working tech demo, it never actually made it to the system. The closest we ever came to an official home port was the inclusion of Scud Race tracks in the Xbox version of OutRun 2. It's a cool bonus, but hopefully one day we will finally see a proper port of the glorious arcade original. Another unusual one here, Motor Raid, released for Sega's Model 2 arcade hardware in 1997. This is a futuristic motorbike racer with fighting elements. If Road Rash and Wipeout knocked boots, then Motor Raid would be their bastard offspring. The arcade cab was a sit-down motorbike affair, similar to Sega's iconic Hang-On, and came in single and twin versions. Controls are as you'd expect from this setup, use the throttle on the handlebars to accelerate, and lean left and right to steer. There are four playable characters each having a unique style of futuristic bike and their own unique weapon. The road rash elements come into play here as you can bash your opponents with said weapon to slow them down or knock them off of their bike, but watch out because they hit back. Holding down the attack button can also allow you to discard your weapon and steal an opponent's, but this has to be timed right, so failure can result in you being left unarmed. You can kick, but this is more useful as a defensive move and can't knock opponents off like a weapon can. There are six courses in all, five plus a bonus track for the most skilled players, unless of course you know the cheat code to unlock it. Each is set on an entirely different planet, each with its own unique terrain and climate. As per usual, you're racing for the best possible place and you're racing against time, with time being extended at regular checkpoints. There's a boost meter in the bottom left of the screen which grants boosts of three increasing magnitudes at 100, 200 and 300%. 
a full 300% boost will not only result in an increased speed boost, but can also knock opponents off their bikes. Although its futuristic veneer and similar tracks are very akin to Wipeout, it doesn't handle as well or have the same sense of speed, but nevertheless Motorade is a fun and unique entry in Sega's arcade library. I remember seeing Indy 500 for the first time at Sega World in Sydney. It was a massive setup with big screens and eight linked cabinets. It really stood out, even amongst the smorgasbord of audiovisual distractions it was in the middle of. At first glance, Indy 500 looks to be an updated version of virtual racing. Once you sit down to play though, it's clear that this game has just as much in common with the likes of Daytona USA. You select from three tracks, one of which is an oval modeled on the Indianapolis Motor Speedway. This game is very similar to Daytona in that you're racing other cars, but your true enemy is time. By passing the checkpoints, you extend the timer and give yourself longer to complete the track. Simple. It was released in 1995 on one of the later revisions of the Model 2 board, and it's clear that Sega's internal development teams had mastered the hardware by this point. Indy 500 runs at 60 frames per second with bright colours and detailed textures leading the way. The visual style is slightly muted compared to Daytona, but this is likely due to the impact of the license. What hasn't aged as well as the music? It isn't terrible, but it certainly isn't memorable in the same way as other Sega races of the era. The rumour is that Indy 500 was originally meant to be on the Model 3 hardware, but was pulled back to Model 2. It's not a major drawback, as Indy 500 is still a perfectly good game. It's not quite on the same level as Sega Rally or Daytona, but it's worth a spin if you can find it along your travels. NASCAR Arcade was released in 2000 for Sega's pricier successor to the Naomi, the Hikaru Arcade Board. It was known as NASCAR Arcade in North America, but originally as NASCAR Rubin Racing in Japan, perhaps due to the sport's relative obscurity there. If you're not familiar, NASCAR is an American stock car racing sport, where 30 cars compete for the best position around tracks, which are typically oval. There are four tracks in the game, three based on real-world NASCAR courses, and one special Sega track. It's based on the 1999 Winston Cup series and features real NASCAR drivers and vehicles. As with many of Sega's arcade races on this list, NASCAR was available in both deluxe and twin cabinets, with the possible linking of up to 8 cabs for multiplayer. The seats vibrate in response to in-game collisions. It was developed with an official NASCAR license, licensed by EA who owned the rights at the time. This license was granted for an arcade only game, so I'm not sure whether this is the reason Eleven left the arcade or whether that's just a coincidence. I don't think any of Sega's Hikaru games got home console ports until maybe one or two years later on the Xbox 360. The game's three main tracks each represent a level of difficulty, Talladega for novice, Richmond for intermediate and Watkins Glen for expert difficulty. Visually it's another great looking Sega arcade racer not unlike Daytona 2 in its appearance, and its rock soundtrack fits the NASCAR license quite well. Although, it's admittedly not the best game in graphical terms considering this was the year 2000. Still, it's super smooth and the frame rate is flawless. Despite its similarities with Daytona, NASCAR Arcade strived for more realistic gameplay. So, despite everything it has going for it, NASCAR Arcade is probably best left to fans of the sport. There are some nice touches like damage and realistic announcers, but there's no satisfying sense of speed. Sega was no stranger to motorbike racing, so an updated superscalar arcade racer with bikes was all but inevitable. Released in 1989, Racing Hero was precisely what you might have expected, a fast, fluid racer, in the vein of other Sega arcade titles from the 80s. You race from checkpoint to checkpoint through a variety of locales, each featuring bright colours and nicely detailed scenery filled with recognisable landmarks. Upon seeing the motorbike, 
First impressions are that this game must be a spiritual sequel to Hang On, and in many ways, this is correct. The game is fast and exciting, with a view right behind the rider that helps to accentuate the sense of speed. However, the game also has a distinctly outrunnish flavour to it, due to the environments and the flow of the game. Your journey through the stages isn't connected in the same way as Outrun, but your overall progression feels very similar, as does the atmosphere. You'll notice at the start of each race that you are competing, and I use that term very loosely, with a grid consisting of both bikes and cars. This game is as much about the sensation of riding as it is about competing. The visuals are tuned to match this, with a more dynamic camera than most superscalar games. As you accelerate off the start line, you pop a wheelie, and the camera temporarily shifts to the sky as you'd expect, whilst racers start out with a faux 3D camera spin around your bike. Due to the nature of the sprites, some of these effects look a little odd, but they serve to give the game a unique look compared to many of its contemporaries. It's a real shame that this one never made it home, since this is one of the best of the Sega 80s races. The graphics are great, the soundtrack is memorable, and it feels like a natural evolution of Sega's other races from the era. It likely would have taken the Saturn to get a proper port, but it still would have been nice. So that was 12 of Sega's arcade races that never received a home console port. Have you played any of these arcade only games? Or let us know in the comments which ones would have made a good home console game had they been ported. Thanks again to Nick from Blast Processing for the assist, be sure to check out his channel, and as always, thanks for watching. You can find the rest of my arcade exclusive series in this playlist, and here's a link to the wonderfully entertaining Blast Processing.